Hi, we move into the beginning of the end today, if you will, in Revelation 19. And we'll be looking at the last scene of heavenly liturgy in Revelation 19, 1 to 8 in this video. If you haven't watched it yet, I really encourage you uh, to watch the introductory video that prepares the context for these two chapters, Revelation 19 and 20, before we watch this one. Um, but if you want to just jump in right here, that's just fine too. So what we're seeing on the right side of the screen is the chart of the seven scenes of heavenly liturgy, and this is the final one. I want to go back at this point and look at the whole sequence so we can see the role of these seven scenes throughout the book of Revelation and what John is doing with them. Uh, throughout this book, we've seen is a struggle uh, between two sources of power. One revealed as the, the devil, the Satan, known as the dragon, who empowers two beasts, etc. And we're going to see their destruction in these two chapters. And the other, of course, is the creator God. Uh, the Roman Empire at the time of John is not the source of evil. R the Roman Empire is simply one incarnation of that evil, perhaps in ways that those around the throne are incarnations of the word of God as Jesus is. They are not God, but they are filled with God. And just as uh, the beasts in the empire, are, or the empire itself, are filled with the power of the beasts and the power of the dragon, which is to say that that power infects many formations of social political power over the centuries. And Rome just happened to be the one at the time of John's vision. So the book isn't against the Roman Empire as such. It's much deeper than that. It's against the eternal struggle between the sources of evil and the manifestation of that in these social forms that, that we call empire. And so throughout these scenes, the emphasis has been on celebrating that it's actually God who rules. And so we see those images here in the, the dark red uh, column there, the third column from the left, where the, the one receiving worship is worshipped under the titles, Lord God Almighty, the one seated on the throne, our Lord and God, the one seated on the throne, our God who is seated on the throne, Lord God Almighty, the throne, uh, Lord God Almighty, King of the Nations, our God and Lord God Almighty. And so as a refrain heard seven times throughout this book, um, weaving in and out of the various sevens that we've seen and the battle scenes, it's this affirmation that despite the evidence that might uh, appear on the ground and despite the claims of emperors to rule in the name of their gods, uh, in fact, the creator God reigns. And so we're going to see here a new form of it. We're going to see hallelujah. And we'll look at that a little more closely in just a minute. So that's the function of these uh, seven scenes. And I want to emphasize that the last one up is in chapter 15. And there's an interesting connection there here. And maybe I'll just jump right to that there. If we look at the one in chapter 15, it's titled the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. They sing the Song of Moses, the Servant of God, and the Song of the Lamb. But as we looked at there, and as you see here, it's not an echo of um, uh, Exodus 15, which is to say the Song of Moses as presented in the book of Exodus after uh, the Egyptian chariots and charioteers uh, push themselves right into the Red Sea and are drowned. Uh, instead, it's an amalgam, as so much of Revelation is, of other Hebrew scripture references. But when we get to our passage today, we'll see there actually are echoes, not verbal so much, but in terms of theme, of the actual Song of Moses from Exodus 15. So we'll come back to that in just a couple of minutes. Let's look first uh, at the uh, structure of this in terms of key words. And so I've highlighted the red words in the top, which are the negative words in the sense of the judgment of the great whore Babylon that we saw in chapter 17 and 18. And the purple is the celebration. And this is continuing what we saw in chapter 18, um, which is to say we saw three groups of people lamenting the fall of Babylon, the kings, the ship owners, um, and the sailors. Uh, and then he, um, we were told that the saints, prophets, and apostles ought to be celebrating the fall of Babylon. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So they're joining with the heavenly choir of 24 elders and the four living creatures uh, who worship God all the time, uh, 24 elders, 24-7, so to speak, around the throne. And now they're joining in this eternal heavenly liturgy. And this is the first time we're hearing hallelujah. And in fact, at least the way it's uh, vocalized here in English, the only time hallelujah is in the entire Bible. Um, people have talked about how the King James uses alleluia without the uh, H. Uh, and hallelujah simply means praise Yah, praise Yahweh. So in, in what we're seeing in English is the uh, direct uh, translation into English letters of the transliteration into Greek of the original Hebrew. Uh, so uh, the New Revised Standard does just what John does, which you can see, well, it's on both sides here, which is to not translate it into praise God, uh, into Greek saying praise God, although it is that one place here. 
but otherwise just to use the Hebrew. And there hasn't been that much of that in Revelation, and perhaps that's to make the association with the eternal nature of this, that what's happening in John's world is coterminous with what was happening throughout the ages uh, when God's victories were celebrated. Which leads us to see in this section the Hebrew scripture echoes in uh, the entire chapter. And although only this part is our heavenly liturgy, I'll just show you the whole thing for now. We'll come back to it in the next video so you can see the bigger pattern. So as I was noting here, hallelujah, four times in this uh, in Revelation 19, yeah. as praise Yahweh, at least in terms of translations go, um, it's 35 times in the Psalms. For example, Psalm 33, 2, as you see there, praise Yahweh with a lyre, make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. But also important, as many scholars have noted, is Psalms 113 to 118 are sung at Passover um, seven times. Uh, which is to highlight that there's an exodus theme throughout this. But there's also a leaving exile theme um, and a leaving fake exile, uh, which you will, which is the, the context of Isaiah here, Isaiah 61. So-called third Isaiah, uh, scholars argue now about whether that should actually be labeled that way, but in any event, whoever wrote the last 11 chapters of the book of Isaiah, as we have it, 56 to 66, plainly is largely situated in the post-exilic situation of Persian rule, and it's an argument against the Ezra-Nehemiah collaboration with Persia, which we've looked at a couple of times here, and in my book, Come Out My People, I have a whole chapter to, to explore, where Ezra-Nehemiah, as we've seen, demands that if there's going to be a relationship with God in a good way in the restored Jerusalem, the Judahites have to get rid of their foreign wives and uh, foreign children. And yet, Isaiah, third Isaiah, will celebrate the diversity of life and lament uh, the idea that foreigners should not be included uh, with the people around Yahweh. So there's a celebration of of the reversal, potentially, of the Persian collaboration with the Judahite elite there. So all the various ways throughout the Hebrew Bible, from Exodus to exile to the quasi-exile of being under Persian control, and then the parallel of being under Roman control in uh, Judah as well, are all envisioned here as part of the same pattern, that these powers uh, out, um, who gain their authority from the dragon and convince people through their propaganda, etc., uh, in fact, ultimately all fall, and what is revealed is the Creator God has truly ruled all along, and that's truly a cause for celebration. So that's what we see here. So hallelujah is the refrain, and then we see in verse 1, salvation and glory and power to our God, uh, echoing the psalm there. And note this in 19.2, that the cause is the great whore who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And I really want to emphasize that because that connects back to Genesis 6, the cause of the flood, yet another element in which God's destruction uh, is celebrated there. But in both situations and elsewhere, as we'll see, the emphasis is on corrupting the earth. The emphasis is not on corrupting people as such. The emphasis is not on taking too much profit or being arrogant and such. Those are just symptoms. The ultimate concern of the Creator God is with the creation. And so in many ways we can say that those on whom vengeance is being gained on the blood of the servants are the, uh, the earth protectors. Uh, those who are uh, proclaiming passionately and in God's name on behalf of the earth, who are then destroyed, have been destroyed by those who see the earth simply as something that they can play with or use for their benefit. Um, we're not talking about a capitalist exploitation in this ancient time, but the outcome is similar. And certainly, as we've seen throughout the book and the study here, uh, the, the uh, Roman Empire did not care one whit for the earth itself or for the people that were usually slaves that it uh, forced to extract um, mining materials and other things. So uh, whether it's cutting down trees or extracting mining or pulling things out of the ocean, John's vision shows that the, the primary problem with Babylon is it's corrupted the earth, echoing the original temptation of uh, humanity gathered together in Genesis 6. And then the positive refrain comes. So when we look back at the key words here, now we see this sense of celebration. Um, and yet again, the sound of many waters, and we've seen it many times in Revelation. In the, in the chart I showed you last time, we saw the internal echoes within Revelation, the intratextual echoes. And so we saw how this is also a refrain, not just in the heavenly liturgy, but elsewhere. But of course, it's also echoing from the Psalms, as we've seen. Um, and so many of these Psalms, like the Song of Moses in Exodus 15, 15, are celebrations of God's victory over opponents and evil in general. And so the positive element then, besides the celebration, is to call for a great party, the marriage feast of the Lamb and the bride whose 
made herself ready. And of course, we'll look more in detail of that when we get to the New Jerusalem scene. Uh, but here it is as we start. So that's the end of our heavenly liturgy echoes, but I also have posted here the whole rest of the chapter, as you can see there, and it goes down quite a ways, and we'll look more at that as we continue into the next videos. And so, uh, with this Song of Moses, both in Revelation 15 and the Song of Moses from Exodus 15, um, we can enter into our story here. So let's look at it closely at a couple of more details. So, um, let's leave the key words up and we'll look here. So, uh, we see this great multitude, which is to say really a great crowd, and we've seen that great crowd before. Uh, at a couple of places, like in 7-9, they're named, first as 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel, and then as a countless multitude from all peoples, tongues, languages, and nations, highlighting the diversity of that. And I would note, in contrast to our, our world today, where diversity can be uh, a weaponized term in in the political context we have now, this is certainly nothing about including a few others in order to uh, virtue signal, as we might put it today, but the fact that people from all over the world are included in this, regardless of where they're from or what they look like. So the celebration, hallelujah, praise our God, salvation and glory and power, a rare threesome there. Um, often we've seen fours and sevens in heavenly liturgies, but there's three. And we see that the word power has been a refrain all the way from 116 through. But this is the final use of it here. For his judgments um, are true and just, and that's internally echoing from 16.7. He has judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with her fornication. One last time highlighting here, this is the last time that we hear fornication. This has nothing to do with sexuality. It ought to be perfectly obvious here. It's not about sexuality or women, but it's about imperial corruption of the earth with imperial intercourse. This is not about human sexuality at all. And, and the time comes for vengeance. And we might have mixed feelings about vengeance, but as, as Paul declares, um, decrying the attempt of the people he's writing to, to use, to um, attempt vengeance on their own part, he encourages them to nonviolence as vengeance is mine, says Yahweh. So Yahweh's vengeance is the one to be counted on rather than human vengeance. Um, and again, this is not the kind of vengeance that's against individuals who've done a bad thing here or there, but against the social structures and the people who side with those social structures that are corrupting the earth. And the specific vengeance here is on her, the blood, um, vengeance on her for the blood of his servants, um, those who've uh, risked their lives um, for the sake of proclaiming and living the gospel. So that has another hallelujah refrain and the celebration of the smoke that goes up from her forever and ever. Notice that 12 out of 13 uses of the Greek word kapnos for smoke are in Revelation. It's a very smoky story. And we see this is a response, final response that we heard first in 8.4. And it began here with the description of fallen Babylon in chapter 18. Let's just go down a few verses to see the rest of our passage for today. And the familiar chorus of the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down as they've done, just as Babylon is described as fallen, but obviously not fallen in destruction, but fallen in worship. Saying, Amen, Alleluia, which is to say two Hebrew words here, may it be so and praise God. Um, as a number of scholars have noted, this pair, Amen, Hallelujah, concludes the fourth book of the Psalter, uh, the way people divide the Psalter into five books parallel to the five books of the Torah, uh, traditional, uh, going back a long way to divide it that way. Uh, so it's to say, just as we're concluding the heavenly liturgy, the fourth book of the uh, the Psalter ends with this Amen, Hallelujah. And here's this response we get here. And as Mounts notes, the response is calling the church on earth to join in the heavenly choir, which is to say the people in the seven cities of Roman Asia, whose ecclesiae are being addressed throughout this entire uh, visionary letter and message. So from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God. Plainly, this voice is not God. It's some other voice. Scholars want to argue about who the voice is but the text simply doesn't say whether it's an angel or something else. So praise our God, all you his servants. Literally, the word is for slaves here. And next video, I'll, we'll look at a chart about slaves and servants. The term servant here is attempting to soften the harshness of the word slave. But next time, we'll talk about why it's, I think it's important to preserve the original um, and harder meaning of that over against servants. So we'll look at that next time. So uh, praise our God, all you his slaves and all who fear him. Notice that that's described as two different groups. The people who are his slaves and all who fear him, which is to suggest that people who are his slaves do not need to be in fear. This is not American uh, chattel slavery, um, where the um, the black slaves were terrified of their white uh, owners uh, for obvious reasons with the whip, etc. 
Um, but this is not a God who's going to whip servants. This is a God who's trying to protect servants from the evil one. Uh, so there's no need to be feared. But in addition to the slaves are all those who fear. And we saw that back here at the end of 11, after the witnesses um, on the streets of the great city were killed and then rose, that that was the alternative uh, to the failure of the first scroll at the end of chapter 9 to bring about repentance, where it said some of those feared God and repented. And so that would be those who are not committed necessarily necessarily to being uh, followers of Jesus, perhaps through baptism or membership in an ecclesia, but those who recognize that God's power is greater than the power of the empire and are therefore in awe or terror of that, no matter how you translate that. So small and great, a refrain we've seen throughout. Uh, this is not class-based. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. Notice the seemed here. Uh, it's to say it's not exactly a great multitude. And notice the, the triple comparison uh, in this verse. I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of many thunder peals crying out. So it's not the voice of a great multitude. It's not many waters and it's not many thunder peals, but sounds like that which is to say one voice that's like that, like a great crowd, like water and like thunder. Uh, perhaps that's to express three different sources of origin coming together, which is to say um, a crowd of humans, uh, the waters of the earth and the thunder of the sky. Um, but this is an imaginative portrayal and that's like trying to interpret a painting or a song or something. Uh, I can't say at all that that's what John meant, but that implication is at least there in the story. So crying out for the third time, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. We've seen Almighty a number of times, Pantocrator uh, from the Greek, and we see again, this is echoing all the way from the beginning. And unlike some of the things we've seen here, we'll see it one more time in chapter 21. And notice this is not about the future. Um, the Lord our God reigns just as Babylon is fallen. Just underscoring yet again that Revelation is not about the future. Uh, it's about an always ongoing present, uh, like so much of scripture uh, is when considered that way. So uh, after we hear this uh, third hallelujah, then there's the imperative, let us rejoice and exalt and give God the glory. So three commands there uh, to rejoice. Uh, and that should not be too difficult. Rejoice and exalt, we hear from Matthew, but the phrase together is not in the Septuagint. And the word for exalt, uh, for rejoice here, Cairo, is only one other time in Revelation. But uh, the word for exalt, um, Agaleo is only here in Revelation, but it's an echo of Isaiah 61, uh, as we can see uh, here. Let's see, way back uh, up here with Isaiah 61, with exalt right there. Uh, I don't know why I didn't connect uh, that one here, but there it is. Uh, so uh, let us exalt. And there, here's the reason for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Um, and it's only here and two verses later that we hear the marriage of the Lamb. And yet it's not actually described. Um, Craig Kester offers several uh, interpretations and notes that all four find scriptural support, as you can see in my note below, either like an ordinary marriage, as if we're uh, portraying a, a marriage here between a bride and a lamb. That's, of course, the least likely because the bride is a city, um, but there it is. God as husband, which is a continuation of the theme from Isaiah and elsewhere, uh, that God's relationship with the people Israel was of um, a husband to a wife. Um, a third option is the Messiah. Messiah as bridegroom here, which is to say the lamb um, and his bride. So to say his bride to suggest the lamb is the bridegroom. The lamb is not described as bridegroom here. The only place in the New Testament that Jesus is described as bridegroom is in the Gospel of John, and that's in the mouth of John the John the witness there. I don't like to call him John the Baptist in John's Gospel because he doesn't baptize, he witnesses. But anyway, he's the one who testifies that he's a friend of the bridegroom. But here there's no specific parallel, uh, a male word to describe describe the lamb and his bride, but it's plainly an option there. And finally, that the wedding is a time of salvation. It is simply uh, an image of the greatest kind of celebration there could be, going back to the beginning of Genesis, not to say there's a marriage in Genesis, which there's not uh, at the beginning. It, Adam and Eve are not married in any formal way, but the sense of them coming together in celebration and in procreation and in joy um, could be part of it. So all four of those are possible and we don't need to pick one. Um, notice that a couple things about tense. The, the marriage has come and his bride has made herself ready. Uh, notice the made herself ready here. And it's very strong in the Greek to emphasize that. As Beale notes here, throughout the apocalypse, Hediomazo, the word for prepare here, is used of events that occur ultimately as a result of God's decrees and not human actions. So it's suggesting that God is involved in making herself ready 
um, but it's she who's actually doing it. In contrast with what we see in verse 8, to her it has been granted to be clothed in fine linen. So while she's making herself uh, ready from some unnamed source, authority has been given to be clothed with fine linen. And that plainly has got to be from God, but it doesn't say so. As Kester notes, the passive voice leaves the source of her garment unstated, um, but it's not hard to suggest that that's uh, God. And to be clothed here underscores a theme that we've seen throughout. And again, it's a final example of this, um, clothing and being clothed in Revelation. So we see it uh, not in our immediate uh, verses, not the last, but in chapter 19 is the end of this, as we see here. And we'll note that the armies of heaven match the bride of the Lamb, and uh, not matching the word of God, whose robe is dipped in blood. And also um, contrasting with Babylon here, purple and scarlet and gold, etc. Instead, the very simple imagery of fine linen. So it's quality, but it's not ostentatious. Um, and who knows if John had this in mind, but it also doesn't involve the kind of extractive labor that... Um, you know, as decried as part of imperial economy, the extraction of gold and silver and pearls, etc., that we saw as part of the cargo in, uh, in uh, the ships in chapter 18, although fine linen was also part of that cargo, so we can't extend that detail too much. Uh, one last element here, this fine linen here, Notice the different times it's been uh, framed in Revelation, phrased in different ways of the bride and fried, excuse me, not fried linen, fine linen in 317, but fine linen, bright and pure uh, here. 15.6 uh, was a variation on that, all to the same point, of course, that pure katharon, which is to say uh, clean or pure, is to say unadulterated. And notice how we use the language of adultery in the same way that uh, this gospel or this text is using fornication, which is to say it's not about sexuality. Um, if we talk about food being unadulterated, we're obviously not talking about a marriage and people having sex with someone other than their partner. We're talking about impurity of some kind. Something's entered into it that doesn't belong in there, so it's become adulterated, which is the same thing to say a sexual partner enters into a marriage and the marriage has become adulterated. So uh, what's at stake here um, is the purity of, of these people, not in terms of sexual purity uh, or virginity, but in terms of not having intercourse with the empire. And and the proof of that, which is visible because it's on their outside, it's what they're clothed with, the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Notice it's not erga here, which is the usual word for work, but dikaioma here, which is say just acts or acts of justice. It can usually mean ordinances or decrees, but dikaia is the same root for dikaiosune, which is to say justice and other related words. So we could say just deeds there or just acts. Uh, and I won't get in the theological realm of whether people are saved by grace or by acts, and Revelation is certainly not in, engaged directly in any kind of dogmatic argument. But it's also to say that what's visible about these people that protects them through this kind of clothing are their good deeds. And that's also um, echoing Isaiah and also reversing it in a certain way. So that's our heavenly liturgy and that sets up the rest of the chapter in which we'll see um, the preparation for the final battles and uh, the last opportunity for now to take sides. See you next time for that. Bye-bye.